Hi, this is Dave Colomar back with uh, Module 4. Uh, welcome to the course if you have not participated uh, yet. There have been three other modules. Uh, module 1, we went over parts of a sentence. Module 2, we went over nouns and pronouns. Module 3, we uh, spent time looking at verbs. And we're going to move on to something uh, shortly here. Uh, I want to remind you that the purpose of the course is largely to demystify the English language, to show that it has order and structure and there are connections uh, between and among the words. A good analogy is like taking a look inside your car engine to see how the parts work together. That's what I'm trying to do with this course, with language. If you looked inside your car engine, you would find that the block is related to the cylinders, is related to the rods, is connected to the crankshaft, is connected to the camshaft, is connected to the valves, and so on. It all makes sense and it all works together. What I'm doing here in this course is taking you inside the English language so you can again see how all the parts work together. Uh, we're going to move on to now in Module 4. We're going to have make a dramatic shift in how a, what a sentence looks like, because we're going to extend the sentence uh, greatly. All right. I'm going to ask you to do something kind of unusual right now, but I'd like your cooperation. What I'd like you to do is close your eyes. And I want you to just listen to what I say rather than see anything on the screen. Keep your eyes closed for just less than a minute while I read something to you. Here we go. At the soccer stadium on this summer afternoon, with the temperature topping 105 degrees and with the humidity at 95 degrees, an athletic and very determined Mary, without fear or distraction, kicked the soccer ball boldly and accurately along the grass, past her opponents to the left of the goalkeeper and into the net, scoring the winning goal and leading her team to victory in a contest with the fewest fouls in any game in the history of the sport. What did you hear? It sounded like a sportscaster uh, announcing a soccer game, right? Well, that's what the description was. It was a soccer game, and that was Mary playing. All right? Oh, by the way, open your eyes now. We're going to move on uh, to the course. Well, this is the sentence that I just read. As you can see, it's one sentence. And as you can see that I have marked out in bold, Mary kicked the ball. There's our fundamental sentence still inside this larger sentence. What I've done is simply adorn our fundamental sentence with a whole bunch of phrases. Phrases, and that's what we're going to be talking about in this module. These phrases happen to be uh, prepositional phrases. And in a moment, I'm going to show you something quite amazing. This is the sentence again, but notice I've done something to it. I've marked off the prepositional phrases as we've done before with parentheses. And I'd like you to take a moment and count the number of prepositional phrases you see in this sentence. You can put on, put the tape on pause if you like. So, how many prep phrases did you find? If you found 18, then you're correct. This is one sentence with 18 prepositional phrases, all gathered around the fundamental sentence Mary kicked the ball. All right. Let's take a look at what a phrase is. Certainly you've heard the word before, but let's define it. A phrase is a group of words having neither subject nor verb that adds to the meaning of the sentence. Again, a group of words having no subject and no verb adding to the meaning of a sentence. So a phrase itself is not a sentence at all. It's just a little group of words. Now, 
phrases we can use as adornment or embellishment to the fundamental uh, sentence that we have inside, I should say, a small sentence that we have inside a larger sentence. Let me show you what we can do with phrases. Normally, when we think of an adjective, we think of one word, the brown horse, the blue book, the uh, hot day. But when we use phrases as an adjective, we're talking about using a group of words as an adjective. This might be a new idea for you, and if it is, then this is going to be very interesting. Let's take a look at this sentence. The school near the park was built recently. School is the subject. Was built is the verb. Recently is an adverb. But this part right here, near the park, that's not a sentence. It has no subject and has no verb. It's a group of words that describes what? School. It describes where it is near the school or how close the park is to the school. That phrase is an adjective. Let's take a look at this. The old house by the lake needed a new roof. House is the subject. Needed is the verb. Roof is a direct object. But notice by the lake, prepositional phrase, and it's an adjective describing house. The road along the golf course goes to Portland. Again, along the golf course is a group of words, a phrase, acting as an adjective describing the ro road. I saw Mary in her golf shorts. In her golf shorts is an adjective describing Mary, who, by the way, is a direct object I is the subject, saw is the verb, Mary is the direct object. Obviously, adjectives or adjective phrases can describe both subjects and direct objects. Mary is a woman with strong arms. Again, we have a phrase describing Mary. Woman, in this case, would be a subject equivalent of Mary. Well, phrases are, are quite versatile and we can use them in a variety of ways, a variety of functions. Let's look at phrases as adverbs. Now, normally we think of adverbs as like one word, to go boldly or to uh, eat heartily uh, with an L-Y at the end. But here we're talking about a group of words acting as an adverb. Mary hits golf balls like a professional. Like a professional is a phrase not describing Mary, describing hits. Hits being a verb, the phrase is an adverb. It tells how Mary hits the ball. Mary hits the golf balls in the morning. Another phrase describing hits tells when. Mary hits golf balls from the tee. This is another phrase acting as an adverb, describing hits, telling where. Mary hits golf balls to stay in shape. A nice phrase acting as an adverb, describing hits, telling why. Mary hits golf balls for hours. Phrase, adverb, describing hits, telling how long or duration. Sometimes, we already talked about this, verbs can have an ing on the end, like playing or reading. When verbs have an ing on the end, sometimes they can be used as subjects or direct objects. In other words, they can be used as nouns. 
Let's take a look at ING phrases. The phrase is a subject. Singing to his family is enjoyable. Singing to his family is a phrase. And it acts as a subject. It's the subject of the sentence. Is is a verb. Enjoyable is an adjective describing this subject. So a phrase with an ing on the end, the verb with the ing can be a subject. Let's look at this one. Writing novels was what Bob did best. Again, we have ing on the end of the verb. Writing novels becomes a, a phrase. What kind of phrase? It acts as a subject. It's a phrase functioning as a subject. Verb, what Bob did best, is a, a subject equivalent referring back to writing novels. Hunting with his friends is what Fred enjoyed. Again, hunting with his friends, the whole group of words is a phrase and it is the subject. Verb, subject equivalent. This time we're going to look at an ing word uh, acting as an adjective, a phrase acting as an adjective. Let's take a look at this. Sitting at the tea, Mary waited for her turn to play. So here's sitting with the ing on the end. Sitting at the tea is a phrase and it's an acting as an adjective describing Mary. Mary is the subject of the sentence. Verb, her turn would be direct object. Actually, we have an extended direct object we'll talk about later. But the point here is that Mary is the subject and sitting at the T describes Mary. Swinging her driver, Mary hit the ball 300 yards. Again, we have an ing form of the verb. Swinging her driver acts as an adjective, a phrase acting as an adjective describing what? Describing Mary. Let's look at this one. Feeling confident, Mary dropped a 10-foot putt. There's the ing again. Feeling confident describes Mary, a phrase as an adjective describing Mary. Oh, poor Fred here. Fred's a friend of Mary's. They were out playing golf together. Looking glum, Fred could not find his golf ball. Looking glum, adjective phrase describing Fred. This happens all the time in the English language. And as you continue the reading of whatever you read, magazines, uh, novels, um, what am I leaving out here? Uh, magazines, novels, newspaper. Look for these uh, phrases because they're, they are everywhere. Spotting the police, the burglars escape. We're going to get away from Mary for a minute here. Spotting the police is an adjective phrase describing burglars. Let's look at our next topic, which is phrase as a direct object. See how versatile phrases can be. He enjoyed singing to his family. What's the subject? He. Verb, enjoyed. And what did he enjoy? Singing to his family. The whole phrase is the direct object. Fred liked hunting in the woods. Subject, verb, the whole phrase is the direct object. That's what Fred likes, or liked. He thinks writing a difficult task. Subject, verb, writing a difficult task is the direct object. Continuing, continuing with our talk about how versatile phrases can be, guess what? Phrases can be subject equivalents. Let's take a look. 
singing loudly was asking for trouble. Singing is the subject. Loudly is actually, in this case, an adjective. Was is a verb. Asking for trouble refers back to singing. Actually, singing loudly is the subject. It's a, it's a again, this is a phrase, and uh, the whole thing should be regarded as a subject. Was is the verb. Asking for trouble is the subject equivalent to singing loudly. So this is a phrase, and this is a phrase. They cannot stand by themselves without this verb helping them out. Let's look at this uh, sentence. His stock in trade is writing novels. Okay, this whole um, group of words here, his stock in trade, is the subject. Is is the verb. Writing novels becomes the subject equivalent of this phrase. So we have this as a phrase being a subject equivalent to this phrase, which is the subject of the sentence. Her favorite hobby was playing golf. Now you tell me, what's the subject of the sentence? Her favorite hobby. Verb was. Playing golf is what? Subject equivalent. Even though it looks like a verb, like action is going on, it's really referring back to favorite hobby. It's a subject equivalent. Now, we've talked about infinitive in a previous module, I think module three, and we said infinitive is a form of the verb uh, that has a two in front of it, to go, to see, to read, to find, and so on. We regard that as the infinitive form of the verb. So guess what? We can use the infinitive as a phrase. To gamble is a sign of bad morals. Guess what the subject is? To gamble. It's a phrase. Is is the verb. A sign of bad morals actually would be an adjective phrase describing to gamble. In this case, Joe likes to gamble. Instead of to gamble being the subject, it becomes the direct object. Because Joe is the subject, likes is the verb, to gamble is a phrase acting as the direct object. Our next example, to learn Spanish, was what Mary wanted. What's the subject of the sentence? To learn Spanish, that's a phrase. Was is the verb. What Mary wanted is another phrase. Um, actually, it's another group of words. We're not going to call this a phrase, but it does act as the subject equivalent. Mary wanted to learn Spanish. In this case, to learn Spanish is not the subject of the sentence. Mary is. To learn Spanish becomes the direct object of the verb wanted. Again, we see how versatile a phrase can be, and it can, and it can be assume many, many different kinds of functions in a sentence. Looks like we have one, two more here. To plan the party was Mary's task. Where's the subject? To plan the party. Mary's task, subject equivalent. Or we can reverse the sentence. Mary's task was to plan the party. Is Mary the subject, by the way? No, it's not. You've got to be careful. Task is the subject. Mary's is an adjective describing task. Was is the verb. To plan the party becomes the direct object. Finally, there's a kind of phrase where we use the third form, the form three of the verb. In other words, if we have a verb to eat, right, then the three forms are eat, ate, and eaten, right? So the th if I talk about the third form of the verb, I'm talking about eaten. In this case, we're using the third form of verbs to act as phrases. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about here. The phrase using the 
verb form three. Eaten by thousands, Joe's hot dogs were best. Here again is the third form three of the verb to eat. Eaten by thousands. This is a phrase, all right? And what is the subject here? It's not eaten by thousands. Hot dogs is the subject. Where is the verb? Best is an adjective describing hot dogs. Joe's is an adjective describing hot dogs also. So what is eaten by thousands? It's another adjective describing hot dogs. It's a phrase used as an adjective with the third to form three verb. Let's look at another example. Written by Mary, the book was a success. What's the subject here? Book. Verb. Was. Success. Direct object. So what is written by Mary? It's a phrase used as an adjective describing book. And again, we have the form three of the verb to write. Written. Seen by millions, the movie was a great success. Subject, movie. Verb, was. Success. Mm, this is kind of a tricky one. It looks like a subject equivalent. No, excuse me, this would be adjective describing movie. Sometimes it's tricky. Over here, seen by millions, this is a phrase using the Form three of the verb to see, and it's a phrase describing movie. So it's an adjective. Bitten by the dog, the child cried out. Subject, verb, adverb, describing cried. And over here, bitten by the dog, describes child. This is a phrase used as an adjective to describe child. Oops, we got one more here. Worried about her golf swing, Mary took more lessons. Subject, Mary, verb, took, lessons, direct object. So what is this group of words? It's a phrase, starting with the form three of the verb to worry, and it's all describing Mary, so it's an adjective phrase. So I hope you've seen how amazingly versatile phrases are and how they're used in writing all the time. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I'm going to show you something now that I did recently, and I'd like to give it to you as homework uh, today. Okay, to wrap up uh, this module, module four, uh, I actually have a little homework assignment for you. And to show you how easy this is, I already did the homework myself, but you're gonna do homework in a different way. The page that you're looking at uh, in front of you uh, is from a famous novel that I happen to have at home here. It's called Huckleberry Finn. And we're gonna scroll down uh, because we can't get it all on one uh, shot. But as you can see, I have underlined something on this page. I, picked, I chose the page at random, page 53, uh, out of the book Huckleberry Finn. And my assignment to myself was to underline what? Guess what? Every prepositional phrase on the page. And that's what you see right here. Now, your homework is to get a book from your home uh, doesn't matter what the book is. It could be a novel. It could be a history. It doesn't matter. Uh, and, but one that you don't mind writing in. You can even use a pencil if you want, so you can erase it later. But I want you to pick out a page at random, and I want you to do exactly what I just did. Go through sentence by sentence and underline um, any prepositional phrases that you find. I know in the course we always put them in parentheses, but it's a little bit harder to do that uh, on a page of a book. So just underline the prepositional phrase and, uh, and then count them and see how many there are on one page. Okay?
That's your homework assignment for the end of module four. The last thought I'd like you to, to leave you with uh, in this module, <clears throat> it has to do with usage, how grammar is used. In other words, how, if you're writing something, how to write the sentence. And we just call this usage, language usage. And I know there are a lot of uh, videos online that you can look up and find God knows how many uh, ways there are to use uh, grammar correctly, and I applaud those videos. They do a very, very good job. But what you should be doing if you're serious about this, especially if you want to be a good writer, is you must read good writing, and you must do it regularly. Now, this doesn't mean, only mean novels. This can mean newspaper articles. This can be magazine articles. Um, in addition to novels, I, for example, I love to read biographies, the history of various personalities, people. And the thing is, as you read, look at the sentences and see how the writer has fashioned those sentences. Did he use phrases? Did he use adjectives in a certain way? Did he start the subject at the beginning or put it at the end? Watch for the way that good writers use language and try to emulate or copy the way they do that. That's a very, very good way to become a good writer. And we'll be talking more about that in our next uh, module, Module 5, where we start talking about clauses, another way to adorn or embellish sentences. Thank you, and we'll see you in Module 5.